committee, I asked Jim to join us. As you can see from the agenda, what we're doing today is getting introduced to our major vehicles um, that we're going to be working with. We will have some standalone builds, um, one of which will be what we talked about briefly yesterday, that after school task force bill. Jim, um, in the next, like maybe next week. His track is we can argue it very long. Oh, okay, yeah, I'd like to. Maybe I'll look at it at the break. Okay, yeah. Um, so we'll have a, a couple of standalone bills. We may move some of the individual bills we've got on the wall, but these that we're going to take a look at today um, are either from last time or they're designed as vehicles to move things that we come up with so we don't have to write a committee bill. Um, so why don't we start with, and I just want to um, recognize the chair of the state board, John Carroll. Um, John, John is uh, going to listen today, yes. and then on Tuesday he's going to offer us um, some general thoughts and introductory thoughts on reorganizing the board. I just want to commend him. He came into the job of chairing the state board and, and immediately set about um, with the board re-envisioning what they do. And I think there, there have been calls from a lot of quarters to have us take a look at the state board, and he was first to the table on that, um, as, as is only right. So thank you for that, John. So Jim, you want to start with sure. uh, yeah. the powers and duties of the state board? Okay. Okay. So for the record, Jim Gamer, the council, um, we are looking at uh, this uh, drafting request number 2777. Um, and it's a very long goal, 13 pages. Um, the statement of purpose is to transfer various duties and responsibilities from the state board of education to the secretary of education to permit the state board to focus on long-term strategy and high-priority educational issues. Um, before we go through this, because it's so long, um, it might be helpful just to orient you yeah. to what's in this bill and how it's structured. So um, on page one, you'll see a, a line 10. Actually, I, I, mine starts on 101. Is that? Starts on 101? Line 101? Page one of 13. No, no mine starts on 101 no, 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 of 113. That's weird. <laughs> it doesn't have 113 pages. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's just out of order. Yeah. See, it's not me. He's right. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> I often have trouble with my folders. Okay, okay. I'm on right. page one now. Okay, all right. Page one, lines uh, 10 and 11, there's some reader assistance here. So, this is the main section of the bill transfer of certain responsibilities of the state board to the secretary. Uh, we'll go through that. But um, going up to page um, 10, lines one and two, you'll see a, a, a line that reads conformity changes to current law in 16 BSA chapter 3. The next section here deals with, there's a chapter um, in Cal 16 which deals with the state board. Yeah. Uh, so this next section here goes to conforming changes to that one chapter. Okay. We're, we're on page 10 of 20-077. Uh, oh, 113 pages. Yeah. So I'm, this looks fun. It looks fun. Uh, I'm just going through uh, how it's structured right now. So okay. Page one is the main section here. There's the rear assistance here, right here. Okay. Um, next major section is page, uh, page 10. Okay. These are performing changes to the chapter on the State Board of Education. Then if you go up to page, with page 25, line 16, you see this reads conformity changes to laws in Title 16 except for Chapter 3. This is picking up all the other changes in, in Title 16, Chapter 8. Then if you go all the way up to page 75 and look at um, um, line 5, conformity changes to Vermont laws other than Title 16, so across the other titles. Okay. And then, if you go up to page 79, this is an appendix, which won't be in the final bill. So 79 on will not be in your bill. 
Uh, it's just uh, provisions in Top 16 that refer to the state board that were not changed. So you can see what's not changing as well as what is changing. I see. Okay. Um, That's helpful. Okay. All right. So going back to the beginning. So I, I would put, just go to the first section today. Just okay. That's okay. You can do as much as you want. But, um, so the first section, uh, section 1 on line 12, um, is amending the uh, section on the state board's uh, powers and duties. So this would, would not read, um, the state board shall establish and regularly update a long-term strategic vision for the delivery of educational services in Vermont, advise the General Assembly, the Governor, and the Secretary of Education and high priority educational policies and issues as they arise, and act in accordance with legislative and gubernatorial mandates, including the adoption of rules and executing special assignments. If I could, Jim, just yeah. go back, yeah. everybody, to page one, to what we crossed out. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's instructive to look at what we're replacing. So it, um, it did say state board shall evaluate education policy proposals, including timely evaluation of policies present, presented by the governor and the secretary, engage local school board members in the broader education community, and establish an advanced education policy for the state of Vermont. So when, um, when this committee uh, moved the bill to make the um, department an agency and to make the commissioner a secretary, we had a big long debate about where education policy in the state should be made. And the, at that point, one of the fears was that there would be confusion and there would be two policy making areas, actually three, the legislature, the secretary, and the state board. And um, Stephen Morris, who was the chair of the board at that time, came away from it feeling like the state board was still the premier policy-making uh, organization in the state. The, the new secretary came away with the understanding that the secretary was, and the legislature came away with the feeling that the legislature was. Um, so part of what I see happening here is to, um, to on, on the motive of the board itself, to say we're not we're not the primary policy making organ for the state. That's divided between the legislature and the executive branch. We're here to um, serve it, as carrying that out and also helping develop it, but not producing it ourselves. Is that correct? Actually, so. Okay. Um, and you'll see throughout this draft, the thing that struck us is it takes away the board's responsibility to implement, execute. Those things are left to the secretary, yeah. or something higher, kind of higher mm -hmm. view, if you will. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Process. Do you want us to comment or ask questions about these individual sure. sections now, sure. or wait till? Okay. I think as we go. Okay. So then, my question is: You cross out engage local school board members in the broader education community. Wouldn't they still need to do that with the duties that they are left with? Is that implied, or? Should that be left in? I, I see, and this is my reading of it, but I see um, here it says, um, and act in accordance with legislative and gubernatorial mandates. Some of the things we've already asked the board to do require that they interact with school boards. Right. So for instance, um, you know, the Act 46 mergers are done now, but if as has happened in one case so far, there's a merger that wants to unmerge. They have to come to the state board and they have to make their case. So that's already a mandate that we've given, but as I read this, the state board is not going to, absent something that we've asked them to do, go out and work with, um, with boards to develop policy absent our direction. So Does how would they sense? come up with a long-term strategic vision? They're not talking to anybody but themselves. Can I so, so this went to struck out at the very beginning. If you go to the next page, page two, mm -hmm. and look at line nine through eleven, is the power. They have the authority. Oh, I see. Do they have authority to work still with the local uh, school districts? Um, but it's being taken out of the headline, if you will. Got it. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so going from there, next page uh, lists out various specific duties that the board has, um, the powers. Uh, one, two, and three remain the same. So one is to establish advisory commissions. Um, two is to uh, have authority to work with school districts. Three is to examine and determine all appeals that remain to it. Those remain the same. Then what is struck is uh, things moving to the secretary, except for four. Four is to review and comment on the agency's budget that's being struck altogether. Um, that's not moving anywhere. Everything else that, that is struck from here gets moved to the secretary. Um, and, and just to clarify for people new on the committee or, or who hadn't been, had their eye on this area of government, the state board used to be uh, in an oversight role over the agency, um, which hasn't been the case for quite a while. So part of this is getting rid of that vestige in the law that makes it seem as though the state board is supposed to be reviewing the agency's budget, for instance. Yeah, yeah. And you know, up on the top, line two, if I'm going to talk about adoption of rules, is yeah. that the rules of all of this, or just as rules as needed? That's just so that we're it's clear that they can. We're we're about to get rules in that very specifically. Let me do that. Um, that's on the next page, actually. Um, okay, so number six um, on the bottom of page two, make regulations showing the attendance of records of students. That's been moved to the secretary. Seven, uh, adopt rules. Okay, so what's happening here is the state board is retaining the ability in certain areas to do rulemaking and then have the, the agency of education have the authority otherwise. Okay, mm -hmm. so what is here um, are the state board have authority to make rules in the following areas uh, the operation and administration of the state board, um, educational quality standards, um, independent school approval. Uh, special education, current technical, adult education, school accountability, pre-K, uh, SU and school district organization, uh, acquisition proposals, and lastly, licensing of educators. Jim, when it says including on nine, yep. is, that, uh, is that including as in limited to this list? Or would it have to say including but not limited to to indicate that there could be others? Uh, including always includes but not limited to. It's no reason, no reason it always to includes. It. Always that means not limited, not limited to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And these, by the way, track very specific state board rules are in place, um, which we'll come to in a minute. So, but are these things also? They have authority to do rules on these. But are they? Is this also saying they? Shall do rules on these? Like they shall have the obligation to do education quality standards, for example? Uh, like when I look at the beginning parts, it's, I don't see anything about like education quality standards, but yet they can do rules on education quality standards, which makes me think that we're telling them to do education quality you know um, I mean? Yeah, so that's that, a good question. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, page one, the board shall, and then it says, in addition, sorry, page two. In addition to other specific the, 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 the board shall adopt rules. Uh, so this is a shall <coughs> adopt rules in these areas. And then on page three, Jim, um, where it says adopt rules colon for the purpose of carrying out and within the limitations of legislative intent concerning. That's key um, and it's making explicit something that was argued again and again during the Rule 2200 fight that we had because the, the leadership of the State Board at that time felt, again, that they were uh, a primary policy creation body and that they should be able to, uh, on their own, come up with an area that they thought should be changed and then roll out rules um, to make that happen. In other words, to function more like a, a legislative body. And uh, what, what this proposal does is to very explicitly say that your rulemaking authority is situated within legislative intent as demonstrated in statute. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Okay, and then on, on case four, line four, line number eight, 
uh, review rules proposed by the Agency of Education prior to pre-filing the proposed rules with the Interagency Commission on Administrative Rules. So they get to review all the rules first that the agency proposes. Um, and then uh, seven is some, some uh, well promulgated to implement my change there. Uh, Pre-K, uh, I said for kindergarten on line nine. Um, this is this is about student performance. And then lastly, thirteen through fifteen, revising this to say the standards shall include standards for reading level proficiency for students, including such grade level or, or level of the board shall determine. So not specifying grade three. Okay, um, 11 is um, the existing, still there. Uh, so this is about um, educational standards for admission and to graduation. Uh, 13 is been, it's moving to, to the secretary. This is about adult educational literacy. Uh, page five, line three. Um, Adopt <coughs> for approval of independent schools. Does that still, that do still exist for the state board? It's just been moved. Okay. To the, the, the section on the rules we just went through. Yeah, and and maybe not right now, but at some point it would be good to know, just holistically, your, your opinion, Jim, on what does this change and what doesn't it change with regard to the relationship between the board and independent schools, um, or is that something you can answer easily? Uh, well, the the board already has, with nothing changes there. The board is losing power, not gaining power here. Yeah. So they have the power in this draft here to adopt rules in independent schools as they do currently. Yeah. Uh, what's changing, uh, which we'll get to, is the approval process when you're approving an independent school. Mm -hmm. that, that execution part is being moved to the secretary. Yeah. Other than that, then all of the uh, other oversight function that they have remains. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, oversight function. I think the oversight is more the secretary in terms of the independent schools, more the rulemaking, so the framework is important. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, line four, number 15, establish criteria governing the establishment of a system for the receipt, deposit, accounting, and disbursement of all funds by SCUs and school districts, moving to the secretary. Likewise, 16, um, this is uh, technology telecommunications availability for school districts. Uh, likewise, number 17. So, I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah. So when you say repealed, what you're doing is popping these out, putting them in the title at, under the duties of? The secretary, secretary. which coming to you just voluntarily, yeah. Um, 17 is report annually on the condition of education statewide. That's moved to the secretary. Uh, likewise, page six, uh, line uh, 13. Uh, number 18, um, ensuring that Vermont students um, uh, have access to potentially equal educational opportunity. Um, that's going to be the sec secretary. Uh, line 19, number 20, um, this is the state council for interstate uh, compact for military children. That's going to be the secretary. And lastly, number 21, uh, on page 7, um, this is the report to the Governor and General Assembly. Um, uh, so this is changing to say uh, on the current condition and future prospects of education in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So that basically that deals with the State Board's duties. Now we're going to come to the Secretary's duties, which are basically just taking all those things, most mm -hmm. of those things. Some of the, those things end up in different statutes, actually, that we'll come to later on. Uh, but um, a lot of them end up in the, in the, in the secretary of duties. Uh, Jim, can I stop you yeah, for a sure second? Part, yeah. So that last thing about the current condition and future prospects of education in Vermont, the, are they still, right now they're limited to K, pre-K-12. Did you just point out where they're still limited to pre-K, right here, um, page four. So this, I mean, this sounds, current condition and future prospects of education to me implies also early childhood education and higher education. Yeah, that. So that they are, they will, because right now they're just oh. PK-12, uh, so. Well, this isn't very specific, actually. So, um, I mean, the CFOs involved in, in, in pre-K, it's involved in 
or secondary. So I'm not sure what this report says actually in terms of its scope. I think you're saying that all from pre K to twelve. I, I I don't know. It sound. I mean, my impression of the state board is that they've been mostly pre K through twelve, and that there's a PK sixteen council or something that does higher education no, stuff. No, the board has responsibility for post secondary, uh, for pre K. It's a lot. So it's beyond. Uh, okay. So this report that currently it does, and this that this draft wouldn't change that. No. Okay. Change that. Okay. I I thought they had mostly done. K-12 stuff. I think it mostly have probably, uh -huh. but in terms of their scope, it's broader. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, so the Secretary's duties um, uh, by eight, the Secretary shall implement rules adopted by the State Board um, in the exercise of its powers and shall. Um, so these here are put them together, they, they're basically lift outs from what we just struck out with mm -hmm. the State Board's duties. You're <laughs> leaving 22 that were already in the statute. Yeah, I I, I, I anyways. The only ones I would direct you to, um, uh, number 24 is the rulemaking. Um, <laughs> so this is basically everything else, not the <clears throat> under the state board, is the secretary. Um, and then uh, line 20 on page 7 says, uh, the secretary has to submit rules proposed by the agency to the state board prior to pre-filing. Pre um, and that says the secretary shall submit proposed rules to the state board for review within a time frame that accommodates the state board's review of the proposed rules and the secretary's ability to respond. So let's just give this a time frame there. Um, and then 25, approve the, stat, the status of the proof school as approved. So as I mentioned before, the state board adopts the, the, the framework, the rules, and then the execution is for the secretary um, to approve the school. Um, 26, 27, 28, um, 29 are all just transfers from the state board to the other one too. Okay. I was going to propose to stop there and go on, but next is, is the whole chapter on the state board. There are a bunch of things yep. to move around, and that gets into the whole performing change conversation. Okay, so let's, let's stop there. Um, questions for Jim um, and again. On Tuesday, you'll be able to ask questions of John. Um, I suppose he would probably answer a pressing question right now, but um, he'll speak to us on Tuesday. Any questions for Jim um, from what you just saw? Sir, is there two reports? Is the board doing a report and the secretary doing a report? Um. It's the, I, well, I'm sure there are reports, but like to Senator Hardy's question about that. So the secretary on page seven is doing that. The secretary is a statewide report, right? So, so on uh, page eight, line 18, that's the annual statewide right. education report the secretary does. So wasn't there one like that for the? And the state board does, does oh, yeah. one on page Current seven. Current condition and future prospects yeah. of education. Yeah. yeah, more of a high level again, of course, more detail. So the two separate reports, but it seems like there's overlap. In my view, but there, there might be some. But they just kind of coordinate on that? Okay. Or not? I don't know. It doesn't well, say they have to. Right. <laughs> they can so, disagree on the future prospects of education. So, Jim, uh, question. You know the board's um, role in terms of an independent school that has red flags, financial red flags, yeah. stepping in and um, yeah. investigating, like with the Compass School? Yeah. I'm assuming that still stays with the board? That's moved to that's an, that That is more of an execution function okay. as opposed to a framework question. Yeah. So the, the, in terms of approving schools or making sure they're complying, all that stuff is left to the secretary. Okay. Which is it later on in the draft. And fair enough. I mean, part of the thinking here is to consolidate policy making and execution, but also the state board has never been staffed. Um, and so tasking it with all of these things that require, you know, we're, we're used to having staff, what, what little we have available to us, but still, if you imagine running the co grid, yeah, no yeah. staff. <laughs> so what is staff we have is really awesome. But the state board has had to operate with borrowing from AOE from the beginning. Yeah. So um, 
probably probably best. And and will remain that way. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's an open question, and John's going to talk to us about that. There, there is still a request on the part of the state board that they be given some kind of staff. Um, whether this is the moment to do that or whether we do that at all remain open questions. But I think it's the it's fair to say it's the board's point of view that in order to accomplish their work effectively, they need independent staff. So especially for asking to do a report that's repetitive of another report, to have them do something repetitive without staff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we should have each of them do a report, but to have them do it when they don't have the resources to do it is right. Brings up another question. And and in effect, AOE often winds up doing a lot of the, the, the you know the clerical functions. Right. So um, yeah, it's just not a good system. Well, and to that to this point about staffing, I mean we're we're moving a bunch of things out of the state board and into the AOE, and that I think it begs the question of does AOE have enough staff to do this? Right. We already are concerned about their staffing mm -hmm. levels yeah. and. And we have the secretary coming in to speak to that yeah. next week. Yeah, okay, good. So. It, one more, is there anything in the board's authority that deals with infrastructure and facilities? I'm or is that infrastructure or facilities, buildings, is that all within AOE, or is there anything in this? Infrastructure facilities, are unless they wanted to add it to the report about the current condition of education, like the education is being hindered by the facilities. Well, facilities, in fact, that's in the construction and bonding or stuff. Um, or just the condition of the buildings or of safety. Know, safety, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, would that all be AOE? Or any? That would be a bit AOE. Certainly, construction, capital, bond, all that stuff, to move the secretary in this draft. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay, so um, with that said, and noting no further questions, let's put this to one side for Tuesday, then we'll haul it out. Uh, eventually, we're going to have to go through every one of these pages. And just like uh, when we rewrote the liquor title in um, Economic Development, we, we worked like dogs on this 300-page thing, and it was, it was really just moving things around, but if you don't have your eye on it, um, you know, everybody doesn't have their eye on it. Why we get the big books? Exactly. One thing that I would mention here is so many sections of statute are affected in this bill. Some of the things you're working on other bills are affected in the sections of statute. Okay. So it's not really my job to, to make sure that check this out, but just to figure out what we're going to say if we're working on other things. That's what Jimmy will more people have been aware of it better. I just want to make sure we're fine about this. So. Okay, what's next? Okay, now we're going to miscellaneous. Okay, so let's start with this. We have this piece of paper here. Okay. Which says, uh, 2019 Budget Education. I just want to remind us, remind me, partially, I missed the end of last session. So mm -hmm. a lot of what happened at the end of last session was the reasons in the Miss Williams bill or from the education goals got thrown into different everything blew up. So I just want to give you what they planned <laughs> what they planned it so we know what they planned it for yeah. and then we can go through what it's left. Um, so I won't see this whole thing a lot of this is probably like typical appropriations which I won't mention but um, so um, on page 92 uh, first page here um, so you had a whole um, piece that was about um, a pilot program for BTC to adopt pilot associate degree programs in, um, in tech centers, right? Yeah. So that got done in Act 80, <coughs> the appropriation for that. So that's got, that got done someplace else. Um, and then um, next page is Circle Program to College. While you had language that would deal with what happens to records from colleges when they um, go out of business. That didn't pass last year, but the Burlington College piece got, got through. Yeah. Got through. Um, then I would go up to page 183, um, <clears throat> K-12 education. There are a bunch of sections here 
and dealt with the um, the school finance and financial data management system. Sorry, can you skip number one, please? Yeah, I'm going to go through. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's what I was just going to say. But um, so we have um, the main provision to look at here is um, on page 185. 185 talks about moving out by one year the deadline for having the school finance and that sort of that is in place. And the previous pages dealt with some of the, the funding for that. So that got done. It was up to by one year for that um, department. Um, and then I want to skip up to um, page 187, um, which is amending Act 173. Uh, you moved out rulemaking by one year uh, for the special education rules. Um, and then likewise, um, on the top of page 188, um, you moved out by one year when the census plan begins. I will note, though, that there are a number of other dates that did not get moved, that needed to move to accommodate that. Okay. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, and then, so uh, on page 189, there's the school district language. Um, yeah. And then there's some accuracy stuff. Um, so we've got small school grants, uh, language that dealt with Bakersfield, uh, and language that dealt with Peachum. Uh, got in here. And the only accuracy uh, language that made through. Yeah. Um, and I'll stop there, I think. Yeah. Um, that's just here if you want to look at it, but that, I was trying to point out what the big plan is before we start to go through what's left. Okay, so what's left? Um, let's go through the miscellaneous bill, which is um, draft 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah, so this is um, draft request 20 0407. Start with the stipend language. So the first section one is your as past language in the Senate last year on um, what to do with records when a college closes. So this is your as past version. House had a different version. I think there's some friendly changes there, but this is your version of it right here. Um, okay. So just the same as last year. Um, this is walk through what's here first. You're going to walk through language that you will. Um, section two. Is this a transitional provision um, um, that, that, that requires um, that if a member of college terminates its membership, it's still on the hook for a year after that for, mm -hmm. um, for helping out the records? You had, it wasn't in your bill, but you had a, second, you had a separate desire to fill this oath um, last year, so I put that here. And All then, right, we were getting ready to Yeah. And then on, on page six, uh, this has been hanging up for a couple of years now, but this is the, the technical change to small school support. This is the Bobby Star. Bobby Star, that should have been done three years ago, but didn't make it. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, it went in in one place, but it needed to go in in two. Correct, and this is where it has to go in in two yeah. places. Okay. So it's not in law currently now, actually. Currently, the law is about this. See, this has inadvertently proved one of the most useful things that we've had in all these bills because it was a one-time thing for Bobby, but it stretched out over three <laughs> years, so I've been able to secure his support for three bills. <laughs> right. So I can make more mistakes, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, and then uh, you asked me to put in uh, this language on school wellness policy. So uh, this is what actually asked me to add. And then on the next page, just to come, you asked me for a placeholder on proficiency-based education. I'm not sure what that will be. Yes. Yeah, that's a placeholder for whatever we do um, coming out of the uh, proficiency based learning and notation hearings that we're going to do mid February. Wait, um, what is the school? Sorry? The school wellness policy? Yeah, that's from this? the Red Cross, uh, Red Cross, or the American Heart Association. I can't remember. Maybe it's the American Heart Association. Um, they they wanted a, uh, you know, as people often do, they wanted a mandate for um, wellness programs or wellness director with funding that would put these people in place. 
um, in our early discussions, I said I, I thought it was, you know, more than a little pie in the sky to expect, you know, they were talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to institute mandatory wellness programs. Um, so what I've suggested is a kind of voluntary version where we have a model school wellness um, policy and we, which we have now, but this requires uh, a score of 85% on this wellness school assessment tool as opposed to what we have now, which has a much lower score. So we have a very weak model policy now. This would require a very strong model policy with the idea that in our discussion we might find ways to make it more attractive to schools to um, implement. So your email to me says it's a heart association. Heart association, yeah. Hmm. Um, so that's there as a as kind of placeholder language. Those stakeholders will come in, make their case with data, and uh, you know, see where it goes. Um, so going back, do you want me to walk through this or do you want to just um, well, let's, at, at this point, questions there, because um, the only thing that I would be interested in starting testimony on, since we have Susan in the room, um, what, when Jim has fielded questions, would you want to get into the witness seat and speak to this language? Have you had a chance to look at it? Uh, I did just look at it. I, I could briefly. Okay, let's do that, just as a way of teeing it up. Um, with the idea that so we have to do something on this topic. I, I don't know if you guys feel the same urgency I do, but you know, we had a couple of colleges go down, um, and I would say all indicators are that they're not the last, and the state is not prepared for exactly how we're handling that. And had this passed, we'd be in a better position, but not in a fully prepared position. So I do want to have another discussion about what we do in the event of financial collapse of an institution, Green Mountain, you know, um, it's a sad thing for that community, but it's also worrisome for the state generally. So questions for Jim on the whole framework of this. This is uh, meant to reanimate some stuff that died in the dispute with the House last year. Um, I guess what I would say is this year I'm I'm going to try to discipline myself to not put anything into the miscellaneous bill that will kill it. <laughs> uh, and, um, that's a good rule. Yeah, to I think that's well, good. <laughs> but there, you know, there was a time where both sides were willing to compromise, and Dave Sharp and I um, passed one miscellaneous bill that way, and we each got something that the other didn't want, because um, otherwise you're you're kind of you know, each side is held hostage to the wants of the other and will wind up with a much more homogenized bill. Um, but I would prefer that this year to losing another miscellaneous bill. So I want to view this as a more safe vehicle than we have been. So if we have something that's controversial or, or that the House doesn't like and we know it, we'll try to do a standalone committee bill for that. Um, so I'm thinking. Parochial. Yes. Parochial schools. I, I, I knew where that was going. <laughs> yeah. So this was the dual enrollment for parochial schools. I think we should put something about speech pathologists and yes. parochial schools. All and then, yeah, that's right. But, but um, that decision is going to get handed down, and it could well be this session. So if you remember this, this was whether it was constitutional to, uh, to omit parochial schools from the dual enrollment program. And this committee's feeling, uh, going back a few years, has been that it's probably unconstitutional. So my, my sense is that we would probably lose that lawsuit. So that is not a unanimous Understood. Unanimous but but um, if it turns out that we lose the lawsuit and we are, in effect, directed to fix it by the courts, then the question is going to be, with the House, who's going to do that? I imagine they're not going to want to. They, they find the whole concept distasteful. So in that case, we might draft a standalone bill and move it. But otherwise, we'll, we'll leave that to one side until we hear from the court. Um, so if 
Jim, just for a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Is this in here just because you said that the dates that we changed here right. affect other dates? No, the dates aren't. The dates that were changed last year weren't complete. Right. There have been more changes, so I wasn't done after the install. Yeah. Oh, so this isn't going to be in the miscellaneous. Or no, this is separate from that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So if you wouldn't mind switching out, sure. Jim, just of um, so that um, you know, Flightly can talk to us and then come back for the third one. So welcome. Thank you. Um, and of course, I'm kidding by calling it the Flightly language. What I what I mean by that is originally it was your language. And I understand now, <laughs> now you have, uh, no, no, to be clear, not Stitely Plus, which we did last year, but the original Stitely was three years ago now, or so, four years ago, um, which was your language, which you brought to the committee. Um, and I understand now you have a, a better way in your thinking about how to do it. Um, so with that said. Okay, Susan Stitely, for the record, with the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. Um, yes, I would respectfully disagree that this no longer reflects the site language uh, anymore. Uh, it definitely, as you said last uh, year, is more of a belt and suspenders approach, making sure everything is covered. Since that time, we have had three colleges close. Marlborough College is also merging and moving out of state. All those four colleges have taken care of their student records. What so, other ones closed since we? Um, College of St. Joseph, Southern Vermont College, and Green Mountain College. Some, some of them closed during right. the announcement of closure last session. Um, so that people are being very responsible, and the, you know, the Burlington College incident was just you know a one-time unique situation. And if you recall, we originally proposed the memorandum because the state was proposing a bond. Uh, and you know the bonds are based on financial <coughs> sustainability, and for the small colleges, that could present a hardship. Uh, but now that things are moving along smoothly, we, and we really think you know that each college should be responsible for itself. Uh, but we're an association; we're not responsible for what each member does. So, example: if a farmer went out of business or did something illegal, the farming association would not be responsible for that action. So we would prefer that this bill start that everything <laughs> in section uh, A1 be struck and start at section 2A, which places you know more more um, information and burden on the colleges than it had been before. They have to submit their plan much earlier. Uh, they have to notify the board much earlier, and um, you know that. That, that they manage their own records. And if they don't, there still is, the state can still take them to court. Um, so I think that that plays a significant regulation you know, on the colleges. We also have a past, uh, AVIC has passed a, a record retention policy to get all the colleges on board with how we're do, saving our records, how we're identifying them, classifying them. That's and, and as I take it, that's not a mandate, it's, it's a set of guidelines. Yes, a set of guidelines. Um, but all the presidents from all the colleges have agreed to that guideline, so people are yep. trying to conform to it. We also have a committee that is looking at academic records at different institutions uh, and you know, trying to you know, prepare and help any institution. So we do have a response, feel that we have a responsibility to help any private college that is going out of business and ensuring that their academic records are in place. But we don't think it should be uh, regulated through yep. the association. So uh, let me um, come at it from a different, different perspective. So we're talking about five cases, um, and including Burlington College. So um, one way to look at it is that in 20% of the cases, the state has been left holding the bag. And I know you're, you're seeing it as the last four we weren't. Um, but so this is all driven by the worst case scenario. Right. So we want to make sure that in the worst case scenario, the state's not holding the bag. So if we were to strike section one and just go with suspenders, get rid of belt, um, we could have an institution that collapses very quickly, doesn't follow through on these steps, 
um, the state tut tuts and you know does its thing, but within um, a month it's announced that they're bankrupt. They're not going to be able to take care of the records. Then we're back to where we were. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the in the language that um, we just looked at from the budget, but we paid one hundred and twenty thousand dollars to the state college system to take on the Burlington College records. So it initially cost us forty thousand. Then we just paid one hundred and twenty. So the state for Burlington College paid one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, and that one hundred twenty thousand dollars is is a down payment. We're going to pay more going forward. So how can the state make sure that we don't wind up on the hook? Um, my, my feeling continues to be that the memorandum idea with AVIC, where um, there's a shared responsibility among the independent colleges, I think that allows your organization to put much more pressure direct pressure on these <coughs> institutions to follow through on these plans and on your guidelines um, because you all are on the hook if they don't. Um, but if the state is on the hook, I guess I worry that, let's say out of 10, if there were 10, maybe another one falls through the cracks and then we, we've doubled our, our expenses going forward in terms of picking up the pieces. So your reaction? <coughs> I'm not a fan of legislating for one isolated event, yeah. uh, no matter what it is. In this case, it's student records, but in other cases, uh, you know, people propose legislation because one thing happened, and therefore they place burdens on everybody because one thing happened. So I personally don't think that's a good approach to legislation. And I also think that you know, the pot, we were taken aback by what happened at Burlington College as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that because of that, we have started putting our own mechanisms in place to ensure that doesn't happen again and feel some responsibility uh, for ensuring that the student records are taken care of, whether there's a memorandum or not. But again, it's, you know, making a precedent that we're responsible or that any association is responsible for the wrong of its members, I think yeah. that's a bad, uh, precedent to have happen. Yep, understood. Um, and the, the last thing I would say is if, if in fact these new mechanisms are making it highly unlikely, then in this case it's highly unlikely that your association would be called upon. So if, if it's a choice between two highly unlikely recipients, um, is it AVIC or the state, um, that's kind of what we're talking about. <clears throat> Any questions for um, Ms. Dyke? Can I just, um, I'm trying to remember what this language does. This does two the, things. The first part that you don't like, that you would like to strike. That you, so you think starting on page two, line three, that 2A and further is okay? Yes, that's so actually what we propose. Okay, so that is the stately language. Yeah, I would okay. say so. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a new stately language. <laughs> And there's, then there's old slightly slightly plus and new slightly. So let's just go with the new slightly. <laughs> <Okay. language. laughs> the first part is just an MOU between AVIC and each of the colleges that says that they must the colleges must properly administer the records. Collectively and, the event. Yeah, if the if the college doesn't ensure that their records are taken care of and that AVIC have, and its members have to step up. Oh, I see. So the first responsibility is still on the individual college mm -hmm. to take care of its records. Mm -hmm. But if they fail to do that... Um, then it's AVIC collectively. Yeah, then it's AVIC. Okay, and that the, just, the costs of another college covered or other. So it's not... And section 2 is making it much more, much less likelier. Much more, no less likely. <laughs> much less likely. Much less, much less likely, likely that uh, AVIC would be called upon. Yeah, the association um, wouldn't be... Legally responsible, I think we would yeah. feel morally okay. responsible. Yeah, so I, I think, um, okay. you know, it, it is a question of if we do both parts, the state is significantly more protected. If we do one part, the state is more protected, but not, not as much as it would be. But we'd have um, some dissatisfaction on the part of AVIC. Are all the private colleges still members of AVIC? 
Uh, all the accredited ones. Yes, all the nonprofit accredited colleges. Two, two of the ones who went down were the ones who were not members. Uh, Green Mountain Joseph. College wasn't. Wasn't St. Joseph's? College of St. Joseph's was. So oh. the one for profit is NECI, New England Culinary Institute. Mm -hmm. And the one that's not accredited, federally accredited, is the Center for Cartoon Studies. Mm -hmm. So they're not members? Yeah, they're not members. So if a college was, and I think this happened with one of them, they could just stop being a member. Okay. Well, no, there's language here that extends. If you look a little further, um, if you look to page five, it says, um, shall amend the memorandum so that if a college terminates its membership, um, there's a period of one year where they're still on the. Okay. So belt suspenders and super. <laughs> yes. Which we think is <laughs> and this is probably a question for Jim, but the, the state board is mentioned in here. Yeah. And is the, this the way we want to, is this consistent with the That's other? That's what he was system? talking about. It's his it's job to do consistent. air traffic pack last year. So we have Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're having fun with it, but. This is um, this is kind of an existential crisis that various educational institutions in the state are facing. Um, state college system experiencing the same demographic drops, um, declines in enrollment, competition from online. It's it's a ferocious environment, and so what we're trying to figure out is first of all how to keep these institutions healthy to the extent we can. But in a worst case scenario, how do we make sure the students are protected and the taxpayer? Kind of a well, yeah, and looking to how to keep them all healthy, not only the public colleges, but the privates as well. Every, every you one. Know, how devastating that's been for the community. Yep. Well, to that point, I don't, we haven't really fully had that conversation in, in this committee. Well, Jeb's um, going to be coming in. Well, no, I'm to, to Susan's point about the private yeah. colleges, too, yep. and um, uh, that might be an interesting conversation to have. Yeah. We, I, ha we have been working more closely with the state and uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Ted Brady uh, on marketing to, uh, you know, together mm -hmm. and you know, trying to promote the colleges more, but it's really still not enough. I think the state needs to do that. Yeah. I mean, just to lay my own cards on the table, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm more worried about the state college system than private um, colleges because they they were started without the without the state's help and you know they operate yeah in, no, that's understandable. in, in large part free of the state so um, but you know Lyndon and Johnson are two campuses that we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about Northern Vermont University and you know I think Ruth's um, CCB tuition bill I think is a good way to think about you know in an indirect way getting money to them and, and making them healthier but we'll be asked to do more directly too so it's a conversation we're going to have from lots of different angles and I did mention to the senator after you spoke about this um, history the day before that most of the private colleges do have articulation agreements with CCB right um, so you know we're, we're, that we think that bill is a reasonable Thank you, Susan. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Okay, Jim. I want to come back. So now we're going to um, 200406, which is the special education language we did last year. And do we have our special ed people in here? Yes. Yeah. Um, so Let's do the same thing. We'll have Jim um, give us a little bit about the bill and re-familiarize us with it. And then if you want to um, speak about to what extent it still um, serves your needs. Uh, did you have a question for me? No. I thought I saw your hands go. Oh, no. Oh, you were just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, for the record, I'm Jim Gamer, this console. Um, so let's start with this bed. OK. Uh, Dr. That might be in your miscellaneous. Right. Yeah. So we're all familiar with this uh, 
call us the chart here. Um, so last year, uh, we just went through what happened in the budget, and it changed two dates last year. So um, toward the top here it says um, SBE rules adopted, 11120. Uh, so that got moved out by a year in the budget. And then likewise, uh, below that, where it says 2020, 2020 2021 school year reimbursement model, that got moved out by a year because we delayed the census grant by a year. Right? Yeah. However, I couldn't change the colors for a while. If you look at the next boxes um, to the right, one, two, three, four, five, all those boxes with, with the red and the gray, um, gray uh, dates, those all need to be changed to what I have here to, to match what you did. But did you say by a half year? No, sir. They, they, all, they all have to be, um, all these changes oh, yeah. need to be made in your bill to conform to the change you made. In Got the, it. Right? But they weren't made. So okay. you have, all these dates have to change. So as we go through the bill, you'll see that we're doing that. It's all just one year. Just moving, moving one year. Yep. So this, and, is, this is correct now. Yeah. We just have to make the, the bill all language. Correct. Right. And so first year now, um, the formula is 2025-26. Uh, first year now, that's the first year of the uniform base amount. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. When, when everything is calculated. The first year of the census grant though was 21-22. Yeah. yeah. Then we, but then we're, aren't we putting together the uniform formula with those three years of data? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we're basically coming to an end point and then gradually moving toward it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. Okay. Okay, Chair, sure. did you say we were going to learn from the Secretary about this, these three positions? Can you mention that? The yeah, so um, Ted, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ted communicated back to the Secretary that we had three areas of concern, one of which was we wanted a, a, an org chart with indications right. of what the hiring has been under Secretary French, yes. including um, special ed. So we'll, we'll get an update on that when he's in what day, Jean? I'm sorry? Secretary French next week is in what day? Is it Wednesday? Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon. Okay. Ted? Oh, you did have your hand up. <laughs> I think he was sorry, going to uh, say that. Ted Fisher from Engines of Education. I was just trying to look at my calendar and I'm seeing something slightly different, but I'll be. Okay. We'll confirm with Jeannie after the fact. So. Okay, sounds good. Need to. So can I put one, one more thing on this chart? These, all these dates were in your earlier bill changed. Um, but the other one that was changed in your earlier bill was um, one below those date boxes, funding for AOE to provide assistance, that's used, that's the technical assistance? Yeah, the professional development. We had in your bill, we had moved that date out by a year. So there's four yeah. years rather than three years. Which is one of the other three things that uh, the secretary is going to report on is the progress on that professional development. Yeah. But you're right, we, we put it out of here because it wasn't out. I didn't do that here because it was not necessary to achieve what we did in the budget. So yeah. I'll put just to note that. Okay. Um, okay, so going to the bill, um, let's see my purpose. Uh, this bill proposes to amend the special education laws to ensure that the composition of the state advisory panel on special education remains in compliance with federal law. Two, make technical changes. And three, actually it's not three here, but um, maybe do uh, the, maybe put in the um, educational support grant supplement. So that's for the rating report, right? So to increase this. So that, that's a possibility for this bill. Right, okay. Yeah, right. And then also proposes to amend the equalized waiting people for a while. Um, so in a way that we don't know yet, but that, that, that yeah. language and that statute is in here so we can play with it. Yeah, so this was designed as a vehicle to do both of those things in the event that we decide to do them, to go back to the conversation about whether things live or die. Um, we can create a committee bill. For instance, if we decide to do, to put forward the waiting formula changes, um, no way around it, that's going to be controversial. And it would basically wind up in the Finance Committee and the Senate and Ways and Means in the House. And then leadership would decide whether to pull the trigger on it or not. So 
we'll have to make a decision at some point, does it make sense for a second year to have these changes to this advisory panel ride right along with something that's gonna have a bumpy road? So my quick thinking is that we should probably divide them out um, at some point. <coughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So section one here is language from past tax sent out from last year um, on the CFI channel of social education. So basically taking out all the current language and deferring to the governor to appoint people to come out with their requirements. So we'll go through with the applicant that's going to, but that's there. Two is the transitional uh, requirement that um, the governor um, uh, Point people to ensure that the panel is in accordance with federal law by August 1st, 2020. Um, then page six are other amendments to special education laws. So um, you will recall from last year that the agency had a number of technical changes they wanted to have made. Um, so this reflects the agency's request for technical changes and also the date change that we just talked about since happening in this section here. Um, so the first change here on line 12, for example, is an agency recommendation or the clarifying change. Um, I would say though, just, just to orient, orient you a bit, this definition belongs to a membership. Yeah. This is what is used throughout this um, bill, uh, Act 33, to determine how much the school district gets. Um, because it's the student count times the uniform, uniform census amount, right? Um, so student count in this bill is bond for membership, which is just an average of three year, three yeah. years, bumps and seats. Um, so it's not weighted at all. So one of the recommendations made in, in uh, Kim Kobe's report is you could change that definition to use equalized pupils. Um, using the new methodology yeah. that they come up with, and that would that would um, solve this issue without having to put another grant, grant in place. Because you're going to yeah. increase the people amount um, by using equalized pupils. So yeah. Just to mention, just so you have a sense of orientation and where that could go. So as as uh, everybody will see, if you haven't spoken with her about it, my sense was that she's not really behind that um, as an approach but the report does make it clear that that's a, a path we could go down. But it, um, anyway, because it, it uses some of the weighting pieces that we already have as proxies for. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So she, she told us three ways of doing it, we'll pick your race. One is a supplemental grant. Yeah. Right? One is using equalized pupils, which has the poverty weight in it, obviously. Mm -hmm. One is doing a version of equalized pupils only with a poverty weight. Yeah. So the three. Yeah, right. the reason I worry about it, a, a lot of reasons, but one reason I worry about it is that it makes more dramatic some of the, the shifts in tax rates, um, and so politically it's a it's a bigger lift. And she's also not she's clear that it's it's not an exact proxy. It's a kind of a a Venn diagram where these categories overlap: special needs and poverty. Right. Um, and so there's a good statistical probability that you're kind of speaking to actual need, but you can't really say that it demonstrates actual need in the way that you could if you did a supplemental grant, because people would have to submit here all the actual needs. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, we'll okay. talk about that when we do the yeah. meetings. So, so again, the first change on page six is just a technical change from the agency. Likewise, on um, page seven, the change on line three or four, again, just the change from the agency from last year. I put in um, line five, educational support grant supplement, in case you want to go that, that way. There's some language in here we can play with. Um, so that's here. And then um, we get into date changes. So line 13, we, we start moving around dates, so we have to move the, the date out by a year, so you start seeing that on page seven. And then page eight on lines seven, 10, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. All those are, are fixed dates. With the dates we changed on line 15 on page seven, for the three years, we're gonna move out the. <coughs> uh, let's see. Page 
seven no matter what. Like fifteen. So if you move it to twenty, is it still those three years, seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen, or does the, does the three years also move? We kept does that. It matter? It just, well, it does. It might matter um, in terms of um, the result, but last year we kept that the same. Mm -hmm. um, you could you could check, you could move it up by by a year, I think. But you could use this is this is a proxy, right. so mm -hmm. yeah. That's You're true. right. It would be maybe arguably slightly more accurate if we moved the year, but probably. One of the issues is when's data available? Yeah. 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 Sure yeah. So yeah. it takes a while. Right. Yeah. Okay. Questions for Jim on any of that? And obviously, we're gonna we're gonna. This is just a quick look. Yeah. We're gonna take um, stakeholder testimony again. And not assume that people still like the language they liked last year, um, and we will make ourselves masters again of the all the moving pieces on the on the deadlines and stuff like that. But um, Jim, you want to swap out again? Yeah, I was just going to just walk you through as well as through where page nine nine these changes uh, are from the agency. Page ten um, these from the agency. Uh, so the day change to the bottom, and then you've got um, section seven is just a big change again, um, and then section eight is just your holder for uh, weight of membership. So no changes there, but if you want to change that section, it's right here. That's what change. Okay, thanks. Please join us, and if you could just give your name and your affiliation to the record. For the record, my name is Rachel Seelig. I'm a staff attorney in the Disability Law Project at Milwaukee Legal Aid. Thanks for having me today. Sure. So um, I want to talk about Section 1, which is the Special Ed Advisory and defer census-based funding for some other time. Yeah. Um, we would love for this language to be passed out as it is. I think the changes that this committee made last year make total sense. We just couldn't quite get it across the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, and if it can be separate and not get stuck, that would be lovely as well. Um, since the last time I was here, the advisory panel has met and created bylaws about membership working to kind of work on the recruitment issue of parents with this, parents of children with disabilities and individuals with disabilities. The last time I checked in um, with our former, the former chair, um, two new parents had been appointed. There's still a pretty significant minority of parents though, so we're not to that halfway point yet. Um, but the last meeting that the panel had, six interested parents or guardians attended. And so the hope is that they will continue to be interested and, and go through that application process for and, and part of the point of this is to send a flare across the governor's range of vision exactly. that his next appointment should be parents. Yes. Um, so can I so ask you then, there's a piece that there is a piece asks for um, That asks bylaws. for bylaws, and um, I didn't bring them with me today, but I would be happy to get them to Jeannie if the committee likes to see them, but bylaws were created. So this is page six. Yes, this is page six, lines one through four. Should we strike that? I, I mean, I think it's not necessary anymore because they've gone through um, Jimmy the Wyatt. process of creating bylaws that have been supported by the, the the special new special ed director and, and the, the secretary, I believe, also approved those. So. so, anything else? That is really it. I didn't want okay, to. Okay, before before you, before you leave the yes. chair, um, committee, how would uh, just um, testing the waters on this? We spent quite a lot of time on this. It represented, I thought, really good work. We we cut through a lot of um, fog, and I think had a clear structure, the advocates were pleased with it. The only reason it didn't go anywhere was the Act 46 um, discussion. How would you feel if we started a committee bill and got it on its way quickly, like next week? So I, I don't want to I don't want to send it out without advertising it so that other potential stakeholders can see it and but we could advertise on markup and vote the end of next week. That way we'll have it over to the house by the end of January. Um, 
do a takeout with census grant and stuff and just yeah. this is so it would be section it. one yeah okay. you think sure. if you could do that and um genie yes if you could um jim is going to take i know this is going to um, screw up your number system <laughs> but what we're going to do is we're going to take section one of this and jim's going to create a committee bill which, and we're going to want to mark up and vote that committee bill next Thursday or Friday. So I, I can't remember who's on the schedule for Thursday or Friday, but we would need probably about at least a half an hour. Thursday. If it's at all possible for it to be Thursday, I'll be in town anyway for a meeting of the special ed advisory. Yes. And if possible. What do we have on Thursday? Oh, Thursday, we have. Um, that reception. Oh, and uh, what about Wednesday? Wednesday looks good. So let's do it. Um, let's do it Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, I'm listening. I thought she was. Yeah, I don't. I don't. You don't really need to be here. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, or, or we could hold it till the following week. I mean, I can come come Wednesday afternoon as well. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Do I want to be here twice? We don't have a number, but Jim is going to create a committee yeah. bill, yes, and then that committee bill will be put on for the yeah. 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 Special Ed yeah. Advisory Council. Well, he gets to stay overnight, right? Exactly. That's they it. don't complain. Well, <laughs> okay. And that bill will come up on Wednesday mm -hmm. for markup and vote. And that way, people can see it between Friday, today, and Wednesday. And so we'll take anybody who wants to testify on it, um, just find a way to schedule them in Tuesday or Wednesday so that we hear anybody who might have an opinion. And then um, we'll send it out on Wednesday. So I'll get it today. So maybe well, we're going to have to Okay. I, can, I can do it today. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Appreciate it. Okay, so <laughs> committee, that's what we had um, for today. We've been remarkably speedy. Um, it is Friday. So anything anybody has before we adjourn? So I, I think we've got um, most of the big vehicles out and kind of lumbering forward. So starting next week, will any bill that we haven't introduced in the last year, we'll now introduce now. So any of the new things that we've gotten, we'll do what we always do, which is um, we'll have the sponsors in. They'll have 15 minutes or so to introduce them. Um, That's all the green ones? Yeah, that is the green ones. And so there are some interesting things in there, um, and we'll, we'll uh, next week we'll do what we normally do, which is after the introduction, we'll take an informal straw poll, and just does the committee feel like going forward is productive? Is it? Is it? Are there four people who can imagine voting for it? Um, and if there's not, we'll at least we'll have had the sponsor in to make their case, but we'll leave aside the ones that the committee's not interested in hearing more on. That doesn't mean we'll pass them out, but we'll take some testimony and go down the road a bit further. Um, okay, so thanks everybody. We'll, we'll commit on Tuesday. Next, next week, just one thing that I wanna make sure you're um, thinking about is the waiting study. We're gonna have that presentation on the 16th, but if you haven't been through it, um, it's good to go through it. I would I would recommend the executive summary and page 66, which is where the simulations start. The simulations are fascinating, just because we're all very geographically inclined. We think in towns. We think in um, so we start looking at equivalencies between towns. And so just run your eye over it. Um, have some familiarity with the basics of the executive summary at least, and then um, 
we'll start that discussion and see where it takes us. Can I ask a question about that? So if we decide to move forward with yeah. working on that issue, um, will we have JFO to be able to rerun data? Sure. I mean, I, I really think that UVM has done an exhaustive job on the numbers, and I think JFO will probably give them some deference. Uh -huh. So, but anybody who wants to have JFO independently run numbers. I mean, no, I meant just if we did, you know, variations on some of the scenarios or something like that. Well, so so here's the thing. I it would be possible to start with the studies numbers and then start moving the formula to get certain towns to, to go like this, which is yeah. honestly going to happen all around. Yeah, I know. I don't want to do that. I just yeah. want to, if we, I, and I, I'm just, I'm just yeah. wondering just from scheduling point of view, if we would have JFOs. No, J, JFO is available to any senator, so you can go to JFO. As, as our policy in the committee, I, I want to discourage us from um, if you, you haven't been through redistricting, um, I don't know if anybody has except for me. Um, what happens is people, computer technology is amazing now, and there are platforms that do redistricting. And so you can literally move a line and it will calculate different percentages of different kinds of voters, different, um, you know, the, the amount of data is staggering. And so what people start doing is playing around with, well, what if the line is here, what if the line is here? And the temptation to want to have the discussion slough over into, does it help us, you know, get more of our kind of voter and not that kind of voter, is is overwhelming. I think in this case, the temptation for every single senator, every single House member is going to be to look at my towns and say, well, I can't have that town have that value. So how do I play with these? And that's how we wound up with the values we have now. They were political decisions as opposed to empirical decisions. So I'm going to argue for, if we decide to do it, that we retain as much of the framework, the interlocking framework of data and simulations that they produce. But back to what I said first, if anybody wants to go to JFO and have them move values and determine different simulations for towns, that's, that's That normal. wasn't what I was asking, because I've, I've been in the situation of, of having to rerun data based on yep. political decisions, and that was not my intention. It's mostly okay. that if we want to have the our nonpartisan fiscal staff be able to explain things or advise us in some way, Will they? Will we have them available as we're walking through this? They're always because available. If, if what you're saying is, would they rerun the calculations? Then I'm not. Uh, I don't know that that would make. Not that it wouldn't make sense, but it would be kind of a duplication of effort because we pay two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Okay. Well, we can have this conversation okay. later. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay. Well, thanks. See you on Tuesday.